After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, and the angel of the Lord came down from the heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know what you were looking for. I know that you were looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet full of joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and clasped his feet, worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Good morning, friends. Welcome to our Easter celebration. It's the habit of the church, the, the practice of the church from centuries past to begin with Christ is risen and for the congregation to respond, Christ is risen indeed. So I'm going to do that this morning and I'm going to listen real hard to hear your response this morning. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Thank you. 
All right, let's just be honest and upfront this morning. This is not the Easter we planned on. It's probably not the Easter any of us wanted. I'm an introvert. This is not even the Easter I wanted. It's unlike any Easter we've ever experienced, and it's, it's easy to focus on everything that isn't happening this year. I mean, we had online Holy Week services. We had to you know, cancel our Easter extravaganza. I guess now the staff's going to have to eat all that candy you all donated. I tell you, the things we do for the sake of the church, but... We'll suffer through it somehow. I mean, you probably had to cancel your own Easter egg hunts and, and your family dinners and your family pictures and pretty much anything that has to do with, with leaving home or, or getting together with a big group of people. This is not the Easter we planned on. A lot of people today, many people are swinging between confidence and fear. But I think mostly we're just ready for all this to be over. When will life get back to normal? I mean, this is not the Easter we planned on. But I've been thinking maybe that this is the Easter that we need, an Easter that we, we have to slow down and we have to begin to think about and focus on, on what's most important. And actually, I think it's probably an Easter not unlike the first one. On that first Easter, which wasn't, of course, called Easter then, but that first Easter, the disciples were huddled together in a borrowed room. They were isolated from others and really, really just hoping to get out of town without being noticed. The men were too lazy even to get out of bed. The Gospels all tell us it was the women who went to the tomb on that first Sunday morning. But they didn't go to the tomb to look for a risen Lord, a risen Jesus. They go so that they can finish the burial that had been interrupted on Friday night by the arrival of the Sabbath. 
the day when they couldn't do any work. The Gospels are unified in saying that nobody expected a resurrection. No matter how many times Jesus had talked about it, nobody went to the tomb on Sunday morning expecting to find him alive. He was dead. They had witnessed it. And all that was left to do was to go and anoint the body, maybe spend some time mourning in the garden in peace and quiet, and then go home. It was all over until they got to the tomb. In that moment, everything changed. When they arrived, the guards who had been posted there, wouldn't that be a great gig? I mean, guarding a dead man, that, that'd be a great job, wouldn't it? But those guards were gone. The heavy stone that had sealed Jesus in was rolled back, and there was an angel there waiting on them. The angel says the same thing angels always say first. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And then the angel proceeds to tell them the most amazing truth. It's, it's a truth that Jesus had already told them would happen. It's a truth they had failed to hear. Jesus has risen from the dead, the angel says. And the women, Matthew says, are afraid yet filled with joy. Maybe sort of like we are this morning. Afraid yet filled with joy. And that's when the women turn around and they run smack dab into Jesus who also tells them not to be afraid. Uh, that's got to be a pretty tall order when you're standing in front of a dead man and he's not a zombie and, and he's now not dead either. Don't be afraid. You know, we take this whole, this whole thing, this whole holiday for granted. People, Jesus is risen from the dead. Maybe we should be more afraid than we usually are. All throughout Lent, We've been looking at these stories, these instances where it seems that Jesus was behaving badly. Places where he, he just doesn't do what people expect him to do. And he doesn't say what people want him to say. Well, if there was ever a time when Jesus did not do what anyone expected him to do, it's Easter. Resurrection was not on anybody's to-do list for the day. And so while he's not behaving badly in this story, he's certainly way outside the expectations and the norms. And that's why for some, this story of resurrection is just way too hard to swallow. It, it's too much of a leap of faith, even for some who claim to be followers of Jesus. But the resurrection is absolutely at the center of who we are as Christians. The truth of Christianity stands or falls on what happened on this day nearly 2,000 years ago. In fact, Paul, writing several years after the actual event, said this. He says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, Paul says, we are of all people most to be pitied. If this is not true, then none of it is. The disciples stake their lives on it. Martyrs and believers throughout the centuries have done the same. Can we? You can say we've put all of our eggs in, the, in one basket, this Easter basket, and we wonder if the basket will hold us. I mean, what proof is there, after all, that, that this is true? Well, first of all, let me say that the empty tomb is not proof. An empty hole in the ground is no, no proof at all. After all, maybe the women got confused on Sunday morning and they, they went to the wrong tomb. The problem with that is that Everybody would have had to go to the wrong tomb. The women, the disciples, the Roman authorities who undoubtedly wanted to check out the story. Even Joseph of Arimathea, you know, the, the, the guy who, who owned the tomb. Even if the women got confused, the next person would have just had to point out their mistake and the problem would have been solved. What's the likelihood that everybody went to the wrong tomb and nobody caught the error? Well, then maybe the disciples stole the body and they hid it. I mean, that is, after all, the story the religious leaders uh, paid the soldiers to tell. Matthew says that story was widely circulated. But, you know, if that story was true, honestly, they would have made up a better cover story. The story, the story they tell is hard to believe, especially in the first century where women were not considered to be reliable witnesses. A better story would not have had the men sleeping in or questioning the story that the women told. I mean, in addition to that, how long do you think their story would have held up when they were threatened with death? Chuck Colson, who was one time an aide to President Nixon, 
would often point out how quickly the whole Watergate conspiracy fell apart when people were threatened with, with just imprisonment, not even death, but with imprisonment. Colson put it this way, he said, 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Every one of them was beaten, tortured, stoned, put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible, Colson says. Well, then there's the theory, and it's trotted out every year about this time. There's the theory that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. Sometimes we call it, it's called the swoon theory. And it says that it only appeared that Jesus died on the cross. He just swooned. He passed out. And then he, he, he woke up. He revived in the, in the cool dampness of the tomb. And when he woke up, he rolled the stone back and he hid in the garden and, and convinced the women eventually, and eventually the, the disciples that he had been raised from the dead. Now, seriously, anyone who's seen the Passion of the Christ knows the horror of the crucifixion. And scholars tell us that if anything... That film didn't depict the brutality as awful as it really was, and it had an R rating because it was such a brutal film. Romans in the first century were experts at crucifixion. They were, they were good at killing people. They would not have made a mistake like putting a man still alive in a tomb. And even if they had, let's, let's just give this theory the benefit of the doubt. Even if they had, do you really think a beaten, wounded, bleeding Jesus could have woken up rolled back a one to two ton, ton stone that was sunk into a, into a hole that was the locking mechanism and then convinced everybody that he was somehow victorious over death, two nights in a day without any kind of medical treatment would not have been enough time for him to sufficiently recover from his wounds so that he could convince anyone of anything. Now, no credible historian questions the existence of Jesus of Nazareth and no credible historian questions the death on a Roman cross of Jesus somewhere around the year 30 AD. In fact, there are so many outside sources from the first century documenting Jesus' death under Pontius Pilate that his death is, is actually the most indisputable fact of his life. In other words, one way we know Jesus lived is that so many people tell us about how he died. And like I said, we know the Romans at that time were experts in and, and frequent practitioners of crucifixion. They knew how to prolong the pain and the agony of death. They knew just how many times they could beat a prisoner without killing him. They did not invent crucifixion, but they perfected it. And in many ways, they were execution machines. They would not have messed this up. Another piece of evidence no one has been able to dispute is the, is the empty tomb. Now, some scholars want to say, well, Jesus was never buried. They say it's, it's more likely that his body was thrown into a mass grave and, and uh, eaten by dogs. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty picture for Easter morning, I know. But here's the problem with that. If he had not been buried, the gospel writers would never have associated such a prominent name as Joseph of Arimathea with his burial. Joseph was a high-placed individual in the Jewish uh, ruling council. In other words, he was important. He was somebody. And if he had not been associated with Jesus' burial, like the burial, like the gospels say he was, he it, it would have been easy for he or his family to to disprove that statement. And so Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb, and it's okay it was borrowed. He didn't need it that long, actually. The tomb was empty by Sunday morning, and pretty soon after that, the disciples were out in the streets of Jerusalem preaching about his resurrection. If that were not true, Jesus' opponents could have brought out his body and said, "Nah, uh." Here he is, but nobody did, ever. His tomb is still empty today. In fact, a few years ago, there was an investigation into the cave that stands under the current tomb monument, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And they found that the cave was far older than anybody suspected, that it dates back much closer to the, to the time of Jesus' burial than, than they thought. What a surprise, right? Oh, and by the way, there is nobody in that tomb. To me, though, I think the best piece of evidence for a resurrected Jesus is the changed lives of the disciples. Once they encountered the risen Lord, not one of them went back to their former profession. Every single one of them gave the rest of their lives proclaiming this message of Easter. 
all but one of them died a martyr's death in the service of Jesus. John is the only one we think died a natural death. And he lived a long life and eventually received the promise of Jesus' return in a vivid vision that we're all still trying to figure out today. Now I realize there have been instances, even in our own recent history, of people who died because of something they believed to be true. I'm old enough to remember Jim Jones and the the People's Temple in Guyana. By the way, that's where we get the, the, the phrase, drink the Kool-Aid from. I remember David Koresh and the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. Many of you probably also remember the Heaven's Gate group who committed suicide because they believed they would be taken up onto a, a spaceship that was trailing the hale Bop comet. Incidentally, uh, Jim Jones used or once tried to become a Methodist preacher. The leader of Heaven's Gate grew up Presbyterian. And David Koresh spoke of himself as the Messiah, the final prophet. In each of those cases, there was just enough biblical language to convince people it was true. The stories are outlandish, but the followers believed all of it to be true. They died believing, but no one dies for something they know to be false. The disciples and and other followers gave their lives in service and in death. To the resurrected Jesus. They put all of their eggs in one basket because they knew it was true. Jesus had been raised and he had appeared to them and their lives were forever changed. For me, these are things that, that tell me of the truth of the resurrection, but you know, nothing is more powerful than my own encounter with the, with the living Jesus. To, to quote an old hymn, you ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. I've known his presence in my life, all of my life, but in a very personal way for the last 40 some years, ever since I committed my life to him when I was in the fifth grade. And because of that relationship, I live in hope. I mean, Paul reminds us, Jesus' resurrection is just the beginning. He says it this way, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead and the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. His resurrection is a promise of ours. One day when everything's been completed and the kingdom comes in its full glory, we'll be given brand new bodies. We'll be made whole the way that we were intended to be made from the beginning. My heart will no longer have a a fake valve in it. I don't even know if I'll have a heart to tell you the truth, but I'm, I'm confident of this. I won't have to listen to the click, click, click of my mechanical valve for eternity. Thanks be to God. My eyesight will be perfect and my back won't hurt from time to time. And I don't know what you're looking forward to. But the promise is this, Jesus' resurrection is a guarantee of ours. Here's the way Paul puts it in another place. He says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of this spirit who lives in you. Friends, to me, that's a reason to rejoice, to have hope, to to trust in this resurrection. But God doesn't stop there. Not only do we have a reason to hope, we have reason not to fear. Jesus' resurrection is the antidote to fear, to to any fear this world throws at us. Even the fear of being hit by a a mysterious invisible virus. And and I'm not trying to downplay all the, the, the concern about the coronavirus. We must and we should be wise. Stay home, wash your hands, do what the medical authorities tell us is the best thing to do to stop the spread of this killer. That's why we've been streaming worship these last few weeks. It's it's not my first preference, certainly not during Holy Week, and especially not at Easter. But it's the wise thing to do. Few people have, by now, not been impacted or touched in some way by this virus, even if it's just that you know someone who has a relative who's sick, or even that maybe has a relative or a friend who's died from it. The numbers go up every day, and it's easy to forget that every one of those numbers represents a person, a a life that's dear to God. We, We should be concerned. We must do what's wise. What we must not do is give in to fear, because fear is something Jesus did away with when he came out of that tomb. Paul reminds us that the last enemy to be defeated is death. On the cross, Jesus defeated sin, but when he came out of the tomb, he defeated death. He put death under his feet. He stomped it to the ground. And if you don't have to fear death, seriously, what else is there to fear? The other night, a week or so ago, it it began storming and and Hershey, our our lovable mutt, began pacing. She hates storms and fireworks and pretty much any loud noise that happens outside the house. 
Actually, she's not real fond of loud noises inside the house either. She loves to, she hates the sweeper, for instance, and she'll bark at it like it's a ferocious predator. But anyway, on this particular night, the thunder started, and I looked over, and I noticed her. She was, she was visibly shaking. She was, she was worked up. Now, we have some medicine we usually give her. We call it doggy Xanax. But it was really too late for that to give it to her that night and for it to have any effect. And so I got up and I went over and I sat down beside her and I, I put my arm around her and I held on to her and I told her it was going to be okay. Now she didn't have any idea what I was saying. But before long, because I was there, she began to calm down. And for a while she was able to relax. And I kind of picture the resurrection like that. Jesus comes alongside us. He wraps his arms around us and he reminds us we don't have anything to fear. If death is not a threat, what else is there to fear? The resurrection says to us, don't be afraid. Jesus is here. He's with you. He's alongside you each and every moment of every day. And because of his presence, we can live a victorious life, a resurrection life, even in the face of uncertainty. Now, I I know that word is full of bad ideas in today's church culture. A lot of preachers, especially those on TV, will tell you a victorious life is one in which you have no trouble and no sickness and no danger from the coronavirus. Hopefully those of you who are regularly a part of Mount Pleasant know that's not what I'm saying. And, and more importantly, that's not what the scripture says. Jesus, of course, is a supreme example of unanswered prayer. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked for some other way than the cross. And God the Father said no. Jesus suffered in horrific ways. The word excruciating means out of the cross. I, I, I've already mentioned some of the ways the disciples suffered. Most of them died for their faith. Tradition says Peter was crucified upside down. And he asked to be crucified that way because he didn't feel he was worthy to die in the same way that Jesus did. And Paul, we know, he had something called a thorn in the flesh. He asked God to take it away and God told him this, My grace is is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness we don't know what paul's thorn was most scholars today think it was a an eye disease whatever it was it was chronic and apparently it prevented him from doing certain things and it was bad enough that he he says he begged god to take it away and god said no god did not give paul a pain-free life but he gave him a victorious life, a life in which his, the, his hope is found in Jesus and in his cross and in his resurrection, a life in which there is absolutely nothing the world could do that would ultimately take away that hope. A victorious life is one in which your brokenness and your pain and your wound does not define you. Because Jesus is raised and your life is in him, cancer does not define you. Medical issues do not define you. Age does not define you. Fear does not define you. Abuse does not define you. Sexuality does not define you. Coronavirus does not define you. You hear me say it every Easter and a whole lot of Sundays in between, but the worst thing, my friends, is never the last thing. Resurrection proves that we can live a victorious life, not one free from trouble, but one safe in Jesus Christ. I love the story of a, of a boy who was home with his grandfather and, and maybe he was con had a, confined by a stay-at-home order. I don't know. But the boy was there with Grandpa and he was high energy and he was driving his Grandpa a little nutty to tell you the truth. And so Grandpa got out a world map and he cut it up into about a hundred pieces. He said, here's a puzzle. When you get it put back together, come see me. Well, after just a few minutes, the boy came in and told the Grandpa he was done. How in the world could you have done that? He, Grandpa said, how did you get all those countries back in the right place so fast? And the young boy smiled. He said, well, on the back of the map was a picture of a person. And when I got my person put together, the world was the way it was supposed to be. How about that for some Easter theology? When I get my person put together, the world is the way it's supposed to be. When we get our person put together, when we're in relationship with Jesus, the way our, our God, our Creator, intended us to be, then the world begins to put back together, be put back together. Resurrection is the hope that one day, one day, all will be made new, and the fractured and broken world will be made right. The worst thing is never the last thing, because we have that hope. This may not be, this, this is not the Easter you planned. 
but it's the one you have. So how will you honor Jesus on this Easter day, this hour, this moment? Will you place your trust in him and in his resurrection? Everything rises and falls on the hope of the empty tomb. We really do put all of our eggs in one basket, and it is an Easter basket. All of our hope rests in the promise of resurrection. I not only, not only trust in that promise and that hope, I'm counting on it. I pray that you are too. Will you pray with me? Almighty and loving God, we give you thanks for this day of hope, this resurrection hope. We give you thanks for this celebration that you have not left us alone, that you've come alongside of us. And in the midst of this time of pandemic, in the midst of this time of stay at home, in the midst of this time of fear and concern, you are right there with us. And you fill us with hope and you whisper to us, do not fear. And God, I pray for anyone today who's watching who's not yet put their hope in you. I pray that they would do that today. Knowing that you are our only hope. For you're the way, the truth, and the life. And we can only come to the Father. We can only come to God through you. God, I pray for those who are hurting today, who are sick, who are lonely. Those who are separated from loved ones because of this, this situation, this pandemic. God, in this moment of quiet, we lift up to you those who are in need today. God, we pray for those who are on the front lines in the midst of this situation, for our doctors and nurses, our health care workers, for those who are caring for uh, those who are sick, for all those EMTs and, and rescue folks, police and firefighters, all those who are on the front lines in the defense against this virus, we pray this morning. We give you thanks for our church for the ongoing opportunities we have to continue to impact this community. We pray for our Bishop Julius Trimble, for our Superintendent John Groves, for all those who are serving you in so many ways through this community and through this church. We pray for our brothers and sisters across the Wabash Valley today as we are even more physically and geographically separated than normal, but yet one in the Spirit, one in Christ. And we give you thanks and praise this morning for that truth and for that promise. We give you thanks that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And we give you our lives. In Christ's most precious name. Amen.
Friends, I pray you go in the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, knowing that his resurrection power flows through you, and it gives you a reason not to fear. Go in his peace. Have a blessed Easter. Amen. Thank you.